nice and quiet in four. Looking this way in three. I'm leaving that for now. Two. One. Thank you, guys. What you have been sorting is quarks, which are part of the standard model. The standard model is the new way we have tried to map out all of the known elementary particles. Now, I'm going to refrain from getting you to take a note that says these are elementary particles, which means they're indivisible. Because frankly, after they did it to me with atoms and then protons, I just don't believe it. Who can say? Hmm? No, they have mass. So here's the deal. They used to think atoms were indivisible, and then someone divided an atom. They found that atoms were made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And they thought, oh, well, those can't be broken. And then someone broke a proton. Protons are made of two ups and a down. One up, two downs? Oh, that's one or the other. I can never remember. But we'll figure it out when we play our card game this afternoon. Um, protons are made of three things called quarks. They are the elementary particles that are mapped by the standard model. Now, I'm going to show you. Um, a cool little interactive standard model, and we're just going to sort of have a play with it, and we'll establish some basics around that. And then um, I am going to get you to do um, some little worksheets and stuff, probably in the next lesson, to try and consolidate this and have, because you, you really need some tables that you need to study and memorize on this. There's not, it's not so much a problem solving thing. There's very, very little math. Um, you will have to add fractions. So if you don't know that two thirds and a third make one whole, I'll go get my little circles and we'll do some pie shapes and we'll make sure we get that right. Because if you have two thirds of a pie and you get another third of a pie, it does in fact make a whole pie. And somehow that works with negative numbers. Don't ask me, that doesn't make any sense when you're talking about pies, but it works with numbers. Negative two thirds minus a third. One six one sixteenth and two sevenths. Seventy six sevens. Uh, I'm not doing this right now. Can you see that? That's the standard model in a cool little circle. In a pie. Nothing to do with um, the pies we were just talking about, but is in a circle. What's right at the middle? Higgs boson. So new, it's not in your syllabus. Kind of it is as like a little she thing, as an appreciation for the fact that it is a new development in science. Um, recently discovered. Nobody knew it existed. And then all of a sudden someone went, hey, what's that? It was a Higgs boson. What? I knew we talking. I think off the top of my head, and I'm definitely not sure, about 2012. Just off the top of my head. That's not that new. Do you know when the last major discovery was made in quantum mechanics? 1950. No, not really. They've been having regular discoveries. Um, a lot of people say that uh, physics is a bit of a dead science. And what they mean by that is we know all there is to know about physics. Let me tell you that is utter crap. There is so much we still don't know and don't understand and things that aren't right and don't make sense and need solutions very, very importantly for us to understand. We literally do not understand how the fundamental structure of our universe works. It doesn't make any sense. Gravity doesn't make any sense. It doesn't work. Don't get it. Um, speaking of gravity, there's a proposed particle for gravity, just like the Higgs boson, called the graviton, which is a boson as well, probably a gauge boson. Uh, haven't found that one yet. Maybe it doesn't exist. Don't know. Gravity doesn't really work yet. Um, doesn't fit in the standard model. You might have heard of the grand unifying, unifying theory. The grand unifying theory takes the ideas of the standard model, quantum mechanics, all of that stuff, and merges it with gravity, because right now, General relativity and the standard model don't really get along very well. So um, you'll have a new model, probably. If you become a teacher and you're teaching physics in 20 years time, 20 years, you can become a teacher in the next four years. 
even may, maybe even in five years, if you're a teacher and you're teaching physics, you'll be teaching everyone the new theory which solves the problem. Probably not though, because I mean, progress is a bit slow. Huh? No, not becoming a teacher? Anyone thinking about it? Out of curiosity? You know, I was never going to become a physics teacher. You know what my first subjects were at uni as a teacher? <laughs> drama. Yeah, I was going to become a drama, drama teacher. Jace, you stopped offering drama. Halfway through, halfway through a semester, they were like, hey, you can't do this next year. Start again. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've ruined it. No one else could do it after that. Okay, let's establish, yeah, went straight to the next thing. Let's establish some basics here. So we do need to understand this. The standard model recognizes matter and antimatter. Pairs of particles, opposite characteristics. I'm going to do some highlighting here. I know, it's feeling spicy. First highlight, elementary particles. Second highlight, matter and antimatter. I forgot a bracket. I apologize. Wait till it happens in a lecture theater with 500 people. And I'll tell you what, lecturers are not polite about it. Hmm? It does depend on the lecturer, that's true. Highlighting. All right, once you get that down, I want you to go and find a particle and it's anti-particle. Yep, pick your particle, pick an anti-particle. <laughs> Hold them up, show me, what'd you pick? Charm and anti-charm, down and anti-down, strange and anti-strange, bottom and anti-bottom, top and anti-top. Yep, cool, all right. If those particles meet, they annihilate. Have a look at their charges. What do you notice about their charges? They are opposite. When they meet, they annihilate. What do you think becomes of them? Energy. Energy. They become energy. Their mass and their properties cancel. Their existence is still kind of there. It's perpetuated by their energy but they can annihilate and disappear as far as matter is concerned. Here's the crazy part. If you energize empty space, a couple of mobile phones popping out. Can we make sure they stay away? If we energize empty space, we can create a, a particle and its antiparticle pair out of nothing but energy. Spontaneously, matter and antimatter can appear. They will have opposite charges, opposite velocities. Kinetic energy will be opposite. They will have the exact same mass slash energy, and it will be half of the energy you had to put into that interaction. You can do it a number of ways. You can electrocute empty space, and all of a sudden, shoo, matter and antimatter. In the Big Bang, this happened. Matter and antimatter got made by the quadrillion, quintillion amounts. And for some reason, we ended up with way more matter than antimatter, which is why your universe exists. 
because if we found all of the missing antimatter and there was equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the world, we would all annihilate and become pure energy. Possible explanation, the exact same, just with opposite charges. Yes. It's entirely plausible that a universe exists that has all of our missing antimatter. And it's exactly like ours in every way. But if we ever met that universe, we would all annihilate and be destroyed into nothing but energy. Uh -huh. I swear I'm not making this up. This is real. It's not proven, obviously. Um, I mean, matter and antimatter is proven. Let's be clear about that. But the potential existence of another universe that is made of antimatter is not proven. Um, but we do know that in the Big Bang, matter and antimatter should have been created in equal amounts, but it wasn't. For some reason, which we do not know, we got more matter than antimatter, and our universe is now made of matter. But antimatter pops up every now and then just to say hello before disappearing when it annihilates with its matter particle. With me? Cool. What's next? Guys? What is distracting? Hmm? Pull down from the top right and press the bell. Thank you. I'm here all week. Not by, not by choice. Okay. Having a look on the board. Let me move out of your way a little bit. A bit more. Uh, on the top. We have quarks, up, down, charm, strange, top, bottom. They sort of come in those pairs. They were found in a specific order, so you might often uh, hear them referred to as the first generation of quarks, the second generation of quarks, and the third generation of quarks. They were found up, down, first generation. I think it talks about it if I click on one. So if I go to the up particle, discovered in 1968, uh, generation first. And if I go to the down particle, discovered in 1968, generation first. So they were found together at the same time because they comprise protons and neutrons. Afterwards, we found out that there's different versions of them. So the up is very similar to the charm. If we look at the charge, an up particle has two thirds of an electron's charge. It's positive in an up particle, so two thirds of a proton's charge, I guess. Um, a charm has two thirds of a charge. Now, spin is the same as well. Spin is a property you do not need to understand, but it's a way of calculating those angular momentums that we sort of addressed very briefly when we were doing quantum mechanics. Um, so you don't need to know about spin necessarily, but you will see it around popping up. Um, there's one other thing that could pop up and isn't brought up here. It's uh, color. We tend to describe one other color of elementary particle, uh, one other property of elementary particles, and it's their color. And essentially, um, for you to make a stable particle, such as a proton, neutron, whatever, you need a white particle, which means you need to mix red, green, and blue, or the antiparticle colors cyan, magenta, and teal, or cyan, magenta, and is teal orange? Yeah. Is teal yellow? Cyan, magenta, and yellow? Are those the three colors? That sounds right. Yep, okay, so um, again though, you do not really need to know anything about spin or color, but you will see it come up occasionally. Not on my stuff, um, but the textbook mentions it briefly. Any research we do online, it might pop up as well, okay? No, no, n nothing to do with real color. And spin, um, as much as you can sort of think about it as them spinning, um, it's, it, there's no definable way of showing that they're spinning. It's just that in their interactions, they behave in a predictable manner, and we can use spin to predict that. Um, the classifications of spin is not like clockwise, counterclockwise. It's spin up, spin down, which again is totally arbitrary. It's just ways of defining them. Um, so if a spin up meets a spin down, they can switch and one of them starts spinning down and, one of, and that just means they go certain ways and stuff. So, but again, you don't need to know anything about that. Um, so the up particle and the charm particle are quite similar as far as their charge being the same, but have a look at their mass. And you'll notice that the mass is given in GEVs, electron volts. Mega, M, Giga, G, quite big, right? The up is two mega electron volts. 
the charm is one giga electron volts. I actually don't remember off the top of my head, but I think that's like a million times more or something ridiculous, okay? Um, the reason their mass is given as an energy is because of the mass energy equivalence, and it's just weird to sort of think of these as having mass. However, it is mass, okay? We just use units of electron uh, volts for them because it's better than trying to talk in kilograms, right? Uh, so it makes a lot more sense. Now, the antiparticle of the strand, oh, oh, sorry, the antiparticle, the um, simultaneously found uh, partner of the charm is the strange, but they were found at different times. I actually didn't know that. 1947, was that before? Oh, wow, so the strange was found way earlier than up down. There you go. Anyway, um, the strange matches with the down. So you'll see the charges there, negative a third, negative a third. Uh, the difference, again, in mass, four mega electron volts for the first generation particle, <clears throat> 95 mega electron volts for the second generation particle. Okay? And then lastly, the top and the bottom were discovered together. Oh, okay, not quite. Fermi Lab, that's that guy we were watching the other day, by the way. <coughs> um, top and the bottom were the third generation of particles sort of identified together. And again, top, charm, and up all have two thirds positive charge. Down, strange, and bottom all have negative a third charge. Now, the down is not the antiparticle of the up. Let's be very clear about that. The down has an antiparticle. Its mass, spin, and amount of charge is the same. The anti-down quark is the exact same, except its charge will flip. Okay? They have to be exactly the same in every other way for them to be the antiparticle. All right. Um, we're going to get into leptons a little bit later. We're not going to worry about them for now. We're just going to focus on quarks. Um, but you'll see the electron there. So electrons are an elementary particle. They do not get any. We can't break them up as far as we know for now. Um, there's also a muon, which is a heavy electron. Basically, you can see half a mega electron volt becomes 100 mega electron volts. And the tau, which is 1,000 mega electron volts. They all have a charge of negative one. They all have a spin of a half. And once again, three generations of particles that were discovered. Um, <coughs> don't need you to me memorize the generations or anything like that. Um, but we will wrap our heads around their charges, their spins, just knowing that they're a half spin, basically. And we're going to look at how they assemble. Last little thing here, these are neutrinos. Um, they are little chargeless. Um, they're basically a solution to a bit of missing mass that must go somewhere. They are nothing but a bit of mass. They have spin of a half again. Um, no charge though. They do have their antiparticles though, and um, this is where things might get a bit weird. They can't have an opposite charge. Um, they have an opposite color. Uh, which again, you don't need to know about, but you should know that all of these things have uh, opposites. Okay, I think we're going to stop there and we're going to focus again on these quarks, these top six and the anti quarks, the top six again, but with anti in front and a bar over the top. You'll see them <clears throat> on your cards in front of you. Let's do a quick table in our notes just of quarks and anti quarks. Whoa! <laughs> my foot got stuck on my chair. Don't laugh at me. I almost died. All right. <laughs> quarks. There is the up. Um, <clears throat> let me... Steal a table from your textbook, actually, and I'll tell you which part of it I want you to copy down, just to save time. Don't just copy this down as is. I want... Um, I want you to ignore the generations. We really don't care. I want you to ignore the colors. 
And yes, flavor is how they refer to. They come in different flavors, colors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So does that make sense? What I want out of the table there? Am I totally in the way? Absolutely, I am. Um, oh, I'll write the page in. Page three fifty four. This is three fifty four. Is it big enough, high enough? You just can all see and write. Make a little table of that. 